Hello everyone, welcome to yours and my favorite part of the week. That's right, it is your online adulthood and aging psychology course, and I'm here to walk you through the hottest topics in cognitive abilities. With that said, let's jump into it. Beginning with kind of an overview, a conceptual understanding of what memory is, and specifically the reconstructive nature of memory. When remembering, we actively reconstruct memories, not passively downloading an exact copy off the internet, re uh, reproduce them. Patching together our often fuzzy recollections with our best hunches about what really happened. When you remember yourself taking a walk, you see yourself as an observer would. Chinese are more likely than white Americans to see themselves at a distance in such memories. This result fits with findings that members of many Asian cultures are more likely uh, than members of Western cultures to adopt other perspectives. So kind of our two big points here is that memory is not kind of this exact copy that's stored in your brain. And then when you access it, uh, you kind of just download it and then you have, you know, access to that memory. But rather kind of a, uh, as stated, kind of a fuzzy, loose uh, kind of reconstruction process of everything that went into memory uh, that we kind of, pay, uh, kind of put all together and you create kind of a narrative off of, which obviously at times can be incorrect. And as stated, there are um, cult uh, cultural differences between um, individuals uh, kind of reconstructing memories in their, in their head. Um, so for example, imagine yourself taking a walk. Uh, most, uh, um, on average, Americans will, um, and specifically white Americans, will kind of focus on themselves um, and um, as, as an observer would, so kind of like through that person's eyes uh, versus a uh, individual who lives in China who kind of sees a more global uh, kind of the entire environment. Uh, a more distant view of memory. So kind of, again, speaking to that memory are not kind of exact car like carbon copies, and there are differences in this reconstruction memory uh, process wherein uh, uh, kind of collectivist um, uh, cultural practices and um, uh, viewpoints uh, actually impact the constructive na reconstructive nature of memory as stated. And these people kind of re kind of uh, re the environment kind of representing the fact that one person exists within a larger kind of interconnected environment, uh, the self, I should say, kind of exists within a uh, the interconnected kind of web of uh, interacting uh, uh, environmental factors kind of versus more of kind of American idea of I am myself, I'm individual, thus I'm kind of seeing it through my eyes. So kind of just like one example there of the reconstructive nature of memory. So kind of continuing on with these broad concepts and definitions, uh, attention uh, defined by William James, kind of this like famous psychologist, uh, quote, taking possession of the mind in clear and vivid form implies withdrawal from some things in order to deal effectively with others. Divided attention, attending to more than one task at a time, more difficult for older adults, cocktail situation. So kind of a definition here, basically, uh, you know, focusing on one thing um, while we're kind of withdrawing from other uh, stimuli. So focus, uh, attention. Uh, many uh, psychologists kind of argue that attention is at one of the most fundamental uh, developmental milestones because you really need attention to do many things. Uh, all aspects of, of cognitive ability requires, you know, paying attention, focusing on something, working through something. Um, and divided attention, uh, kind of the idea, kind of straightforward here, you're dividing your attention, uh, attending more uh, to more than one task at a time. So kind of a lot of people think, oh, I'm a great kind of multitasker, but studies demonstrate that for uh, individuals, kind of performance is reduced on task when they're splitting attention between uh, multiple tasks at the same time. And uh, kind of the um, uh, cocktail study is an example for older adults who actually struggle at higher levels of multitask uh, at multitasking uh, scenarios than uh, younger uh, adults. And basically what the scenario is that kind of imagine yourself in a party and there's either one person talking to you or there's multiple people talking to you. Um, you can imagine varying degrees of background noise, maybe a band playing in the background. And kind of the idea is that the more stim distracting stimuli, that is, the more people are talking to you at the same time, or the more people are talking at the same time overall, or the more background noise, uh, kind of the more distractors, uh, the worse um, the, or the greater the divide um, between um, divided attention abilities are between um, uh, older adults and younger adults and kind of. Uh, more straightforward, uh, the more kind of um, distractors in an environment, the worse older adults perform in kind of uh, divided attention tasks. 
Another kind of fundamental uh, theory of older adults' um, attention and kind of emotional and cognitive processing is socio-emotional selectivity theory. Um, kind of the big takeaways here is um, the idea behind this is that the perception that one has little time left to live, it prompts more emphasis on the needs of fulfilling current emotional needs. There's a positivity effect. Tendency for older adults to pay attention to, better remember, and place more priority on positive information than on negative information. Research suggests that brain areas involved in emotion, uh, such as the amygdala and uh, ventral medial area of the prefrontal cortex, degenerate less with age than other brain areas involved in co uh, cognition. So kind of the idea here is that older adults um, uh, pay attention more to positive uh, emotion stimuli. So um, they'll remember it better, they'll pay more attention to it, uh, they value it more, they place more priority on it. And kind of a social theoretical reason for this is because, you know, it's kind of like, oh, I'm dying soon, so therefore I just kind of like max out positivity and ignore kind of the negativity of things going around my life. Um, and thus, and, and not only that, but also I'm going to focus kind of on fulfilling my kind of uh, emotional needs because I'm trying to maximize my remaining time uh, uh, alive. Uh, and kind of a, a neuroimaging studies, uh, there's some support for this in neuroimaging studies with kind of areas um, involved with the kind of emotional processing thought to uh, kind of degenerate less. Uh, a, a slower rate of degeneration compared to other areas that are un, that are less involved in um, emotional processing. And again, this is kind of theoretical, and, and all these kind of areas in the brain kind of work together in a more of a holistic way. But they're uh, in a kind of a holistic system, I should say. But kind of there are areas of specialization, and maybe these areas of specialization kind of reflect in the rates of degeneration of these areas of specialization. Um, specifically the amygdala and the ventral medial area of the prefrontal cortex possibly reflect uh, or is neurological evidence of this uh, social emotional selectivity theory and specifically this positivity bias. Older adults displayed higher levels of performance for positive images compared to the neutral and negative images. Young and middle adults recalled more images overall. Emotional, uh, overall emotional well-being increased with age. Older adults also, also experienced longer lasting positive emotions uh, fleeting negative emotions, fewer emotional ups and downs per day. So kind of uh, kind of a task wherein uh, all different uh, age groups are shown um, different uh, images, and then the the, the uh, participants are asked to kind of just recall what it is that they saw. And kind of the idea here is that uh, or results kind of demonstrating this task that older adults recall. Um, uh, images that had a, a positive orientation to them uh, at higher rates than kind of negative image. So they, re so they remember positive things, positive images more than negative images. Well, at the same time, um, uh, still though, younger and middle-aged adults recall more images overall. Um, but kind of the degree of that difference of how of the rates of recall uh, shrink if the images are positive. So kind of the, the degree of cognitive abilities, uh, the difference in, in cognitive abilities um, between younger adults and older adults uh, with younger adults performing better uh, on these recall tasks actually decrease that, that, that rate of difference decreases if the image is positive as opposed to a neutral image or a negative image. So kind of suggesting again that the, that, that the emotional valence tied to the memory task or the thing that's being recalled um, uh, impacts the degree of memorization in older adults. And this is just kind of a, another study uh, looking at uh, advertisements uh, targeting younger and older adults. And this study found that older participants remember more information when younger uh, than uh, younger participants when uh, material has emotional appeal. Younger participants remember more when uh, material has knowledge or neutral appeal. So kind of this study actually found that advertisements with strong emotional appeal, uh, older adults actually recall them more than uh, younger um, uh, participants. Kind of again, possibly reflecting this emphasis, this focus, this priority given to uh, images or just things that exist in the world that are kind of positive in nature. Wherein in this study found that younger adults uh, remember more material when it was more uh, kind of fact-based or kind of a, a neutral appeal with uh, not like laden with uh, positivity. Next kind of uh, more of a neutral uh, cognitive ability. And in this case, a visual search task. This is the process of searching your environment in an attempt to locate a particular item. 
Uh, participants are asked to find objects in a room. Uh, it's a study. Find objects within 20 seconds. Groups with most falls had most failed attempts. So basically, you put uh, participants in a room and you ask them to find uh, a particular object within 20 seconds. Uh, and then you just track how many uh, errors there are, error being uh, the inability to find an object within uh, uh, 20 seconds. And you can kind of see on the chart here, the six-year-olds um, uh, performing poorly, and then uh, as um, P, uh, individuals um, approach emerging adulthood, early adulthood, they, uh, they are able to find objects in the room at, at quicker rates and thus um, have lower percentages of errors, again, that being uh, finding an object within 20 seconds. But then you can also hear, see here uh, healthy 75-year-olds uh, and faller 73-year-olds. So you can actually see the, uh, the heter uh, heterogeneity of um, of older adults and you know what i mean just kind of the diversity of, of results and kind of speaks to the different uh, pathways of, of uh, aging development across aging um so healthy 75 year olds performing better than younger 73 year olds who have a history of of falls so you can kind of see here the different uh, developmental tracks and different kind of cognitive abilities depending on uh health circumstances Kind of again reflecting the idea that there's not one single developmental track and that kind of uh, lifestyles uh, life circumstances impact your kind of abilities and as stated followers and in individuals who have a history of falling thus possibly are more socially isolated uh performing less cognitively challenging tasks maybe performing less uh physical exercising or maybe also have kind of a pre-existing condition that uh, may be contributing to falls um, um, ultimately, uh, that whatever that collection of, of uh, risk factors are, uh, contributing to uh, lower rates of successful visual uh, search uh, attempts in this task, and lower than uh, it actually performing worse than people who are older than them in, in this uh, study. Okay, so we kind of that like groundwork that, uh, there for older adults. Let's now kind of talk discuss uh, types of memory. Uh, we have retrieval which is the process of getting the information out when it is needed, often uh, doesn't match what we originally put into it. Recognition, selecting previously remembered information from an array of options, such as a multiple choice quiz. And recall memory, generating previously remembered information, requires active retrieval without the uh, aid of cues. Uh, when did Florida become an American state? So I want to focus on recognition and recall memory. Recognition kind of being a standard, um, kind of a multiple choice. So you're giving uh, multiple options. You can look at the options and then um, decide what is the, you think is the correct answer versus recall memory wherein I just ask you a specific question and then without any cues, without any help, you have to freely recall it. Obviously, recall memory is going to be more difficult because you have kind of those less visual cues and your options are kind of like theoretically limitless um, because you just have to free recall uh, that information. Short term memory, a memory system that retains information for limited durations is closely related to working memory. It's brief in duration, about five to 20 seconds. And long-term memory believed to be a relatively permanent and seemingly unlimited store of information. So kind of sort of, kind of straightforward here. We have short and we have long-term with short-term being five to 20 seconds, um, uh, kind of uh, related to working memory, which we'll discuss uh, momentarily uh, versus long-term memory, which is theoretically infinite and uh, kind of more permanent uh, memory uh, within an individual. Working memory refers to our ability to hold onto information we're currently thinking about attending to or processing actively. It's generally referred to in the context of trying to achieve a goal. So kind of a temporary memory that we're actively thinking about, kind of we're working through in our mind, maybe working through a math problem, something along those lines, and we're trying to ultimately achieve a goal. Um, some uh, psychologists debate if working memory is kind of a real kind of uh, actual specific form of memory, but it doesn't matter for this class. Um, and then kind of the image that you see here is actually from uh, my work in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is a working memory task uh, wherein I tell these, um, depending on the age, four to six year olds. Uh, to sort these uh, yellow, uh, for example, uh, the child has a yellow block in uh, his or her hand. And uh, prior to the experiment, 
Uh, the experimenter tells the child, place the yellow blocks into the yellow block bucket and the blue bo blocks into the blue bucket. The child then has to uh, you know, remember those rules and then uh, sort the blocks appropriately. So that's kind of an example of a working memory task. So kind of holding that memory, uh, that those rules temporary in your mind, actively attending to those rules to achieve a goal, in that case, sorting the blocks correctly. Some more definitions, and then we'll talk about changes in working memory throughout uh, the lifespan. The phonological loop maintains information about auditory stimuli. The visual spatial sketch pack maintains information about visual stimuli, so visual, visual. Um, central executive oversees working memory, allocating resources where needed, and monitoring whether cognitive strategies are being effective. Central executive uh, is most negatively impacted by age. So kind of the central executive is kind of like this theoretical cognitive um, executive that's kind of overseeing kind of memory, uh, judging how well you're performing in like a memory, uh, working memory task or kind of some kind of goal, whatever your goal is, um, or you're trying to pay attention to in that moment, um, kind of this executive kind of uh, evaluates and allocates the necessary resources again, and resources being kind of cognitive attention, um, focus, uh, you know, whatever, and then kind of on a biological level, kind of neural activity, uh, whatever neurotransmitters and um, um, inappropriate like glucose levels. It doesn't matter for this class, but kind of the idea here is that there's this central executive and it's kind of monitoring how well uh, you're performing on a task, uh, what are the cognitive strategies you're using are appropriate, and then allocating resources uh, as needed to perform well on that, uh, whatever your goal is. And that uh, central executive is the most negatively impacted by age. Now let's review a study about working memory. Tests that require allocation of attention between different stimuli, older adults uh, fare worse than do uh, than younger adults. Older and younger adults uh, were asked to learn two tasks simultaneously. With practice, young adults managed to learn and perform each task without any loss in speed and efficiency. So experimenters asked uh, young adults and older adults to learn two tasks at the same time. Young, young adults doing fine without any loss of speed and efficiency. None of the older adults, however, were able to achieve this level of speed and efficiency when learning two tasks simultaneously. Older adults could perform at young adult levels if they had been asked to learn each task individually. Having older adults learn and perform tasks together was too taxing for the central executive. Working memory tasks that do not re uh, require much input from the ex uh, exec uh, central executive, such as a digit, digit span task, which uses predominantly the phonological loop, we find that older adults perform on par with young adults. Verbally uh, state digits at the end of the list repeat back in same order. So kind of we're getting at a few points here. One, which we already talked about, kind of that divided attention finding. And here in this study, uh, researchers asked, as stated, uh, young adults and older adults to learn two tasks simultaneously. The younger adults were able to uh, learn both tasks without any loss of speed and efficiency. So they were kind of learning, so they're dividing their attention uh, between those two tasks and they're learning them um, at uh, acceptable rates. So one second they're looking at one task and they're working and kind of learning and then another, you know, whatever, uh, a minute later they move on to the other task and they're jumping basically back and forth between learning these two different tasks at an optimal level. Uh, older adults were not able to kind of perform this kind of simultaneous uh, jumping back and forth uh, learning of two new novel tasks. Uh, however, if you put, uh, if you ask the older adults to um, to learn uh, the task individually, one at a time, they perform at levels close to younger adults. So, then the idea here is that uh, due to uh, kind of a, de a decline in the central executive. That is uh, the ability to allocate resources, monitoring whether strategies are working. That ability to allocate resources uh, kind of declined with age, and thus um, older adults are unable to uh, evaluate whether their uh, cognitive strategies of kind of learning these tasks are working properly. They can't. The the what kind of a decrease ability. You know, this is all conceptually speaking in kind of layman terms, but kind of. Uh, their kind of baseline cognitive, their cognitive executive ability being less uh, kind of uh, means that they're less able to kind of 
um, evaluate how well they're doing uh, as they're uh, learning both these tests at the same time and allocate resources accordingly. So for one task saying, oh, I'm not doing this correctly, therefore I need to may pay attention to this one specific part of this task for a second to make sure that I'm learning this correctly. Um, and then jump back over here to this other task. So kind of that ability to uh, allocate resources, jump back and forth is decreased in older adults. And kind of as evidence by the fact that if you um, ask an older adult to learn one of those tasks, a single task, one at a time, they perform, uh, they're able to do so. And the final point is just kind of discussing that, uh, that these declines of memory are not this universal decline. And we saw that with the followers versus the non-followers, but we also see this in different types of memory. Different uh, types of memory and different tasks have different rates of, of uh, or older adults perform at uh, uh, different rates. Uh, the performance fluctuates depending on the, the, the demands of the task. So uh, tasks that don't require uh, use of the central executive as much, kind of this balancing of multiple things, allocating resources, monitoring how well you're doing, such as a, um, a digit task where I'm literally just verbally stating digits, and then you have to repeat it back to me in that order, uh, older adults perform uh, better on those types of tasks uh, than uh, tasks that require uh, use of the central executive. So information uh, is represented in, in uh, long-term memory in one of two kind of general ways, declarative and non-declarative memories. Uh, implicit slash uh, procedural memory uh, occurs uh, unintentionally, uh, automatic, and with, uh, with, without awareness, remains intact throughout life. And that is the uh, non-declarative memory. So kind of implicit procedural uh, memory. Um, versus explicit memory, declarative memory, involves deliberate, effortful uh, collection of events, semantic memory, general facts, how many states are there, episodic, specific memory about a uh, sequence of events, uh, where were you during quarantine, can be assessed by recall or uh, recognition tasks. So kind of the idea here, kind of again, two uh, kind of uh, broad uh, types of long-term memory. We have this implicit, procedural, non-declarative memory, which you can think of as this automatic process outside of your awareness, and it remains intact throughout your life. So, um, it, so basically just information that's kind of outside your consciousness. So something like riding a bike or... Um, or maybe like driving a car, you know, sometimes you're just kind of daydreaming or like, and you're drove for 40 minutes and you're home all of a sudden, you're like, how the hell did I get home? You know, that's kind of like an unaware, this automatic process that, that it kind of uh, does not require uh, focused, deliberate attention. Obviously those things can bounce back and forth, you know, there's a traffic jam or whatever. Uh, but again, kind of, it's automatic. Versus kind of this explicit declarative memory, which involves deliberate, effortful, uh, recollection of events. You're kind of focusing on that task. You're trying to remember. Uh, so if I ask you a, a general fact, such as uh, semantic memory, how many states are there? You have to think about that. Uh, and also episodic memory. So I ask you specific memory about a sequence of events. So where were you on the, whatever, uh, one week ago? That's something that you, you know, have to think about um, and uh, recalls, uh, requires an effortful uh, recollection of, of, the, of those events. So we have automatic, something you're really not thinking about, which is kind of implicit procedural versus this effortful recollection, uh, deliberate, intentional memory. Again, being semantic and episodic, with semantic being uh, general facts and episodic being, think of it like an episode of a TV show, something along those lines. So specific memory about a sequence of events. Now looking at changes in long-term memory, there's little change in implicit memory over adulthood such as driving a car, tying one's shoes, or running a bike, it is an automatic cognitive process. Semantic and episodic memory are part of the explicit memory system, which requires constant, uh, conscious effort to create and retrieve. Episodic memory show greater age declines than semantic memory. It may be harder to encode and retrieve because they maintain at least two different types of memory, the event and when and where the event took place. Semantic memories are not tied to any particular timeline. Adults, uh, older adult poor performance on episodic memory appears to be related to slower processing of information and the difficulty of the task. As the task becomes increasingly difficult, the gap between each group's uh, age group's uh, performance increased for episodic memory more so than for semantic memory. So kind of as stated, kind of examples of that automatic, that implicit memory, tying shoe, driving a bike, or riding a bike, uh, driving a car. Um, 
uh, is uh, kind of automatic process. It's outside of your kind of deliberate attention. You just do it. You're really not even paying attention to what you're doing. Um, and uh, you're able to perform that test successfully uh, versus kind of those explicit um, declarative uh, types of memory. And interestingly, as I've kind of alluded to throughout this chapter, the rates of differences between younger and older adults on a uh, memory tasks uh, are, are different depending on the type of memory being assessed. And um, interestingly, episodic memories are uh, show greater age declines compared to semantic memories. And as kind of stated, semantic memories kind of just being the standard facts, so you know something like Jeopardy or something along those lines, that uh, that is kind of just like a single kind of memory, uh, more kind of a, again kind of like trivia vase versus something like a episodic memory. If you remember, if, if you remember a good example of episodic memory, um, a, sp a specific memory about sequence events. Uh, you know, where were you on X date? So when you're when someone gets asked an episodic memory question, they have to theoretically uh, remember at least two different kinds of memory. So the exact event, when it took place, where it took place, all these extra kind of little details. Who was at the event? Where were you? How did you feel? So it's all these kind of uh, subjective and kind of interpersonal and um, um, all, uh, it includes all these extra environmental factors uh, as part of that memory, thus kind of that extra demand uh, for um, for that type of memory because of all those components you have to remember, as I stated, um, you know, who was there, when was it, where was it, what did you feel like, what was going down, um, that's more challenging because there's just more elements to that memory. And interestingly, um, on tasks of episodic memory versus on tasks of semantic memory, older adults, the gap between uh, each age group performance, so younger adults still kind of performing better than older adults, but that gap, that, uh, that difference in um, uh, better performance decreases if it's a semantic memory task uh, as compared to an episodic memory task. Again, kind of Suggesting again, there's not a universal decline in cognitive abilities, uh, kind of your lifespan matters, and different kinds of memory uh, um, change at uh, different rates. Next, perspective memory, remembering things we need to do in the future, such as remembering a doctor's appointment next week or to take medication before bedtime. Humans are fairly good at perspective memory when they have little distractors. When there are competing tasks that, uh, that are also demanding our attention, this type of memory rapidly declines. Prospective memories are often divided into time-based perspective memories, such as having to remember to do something at a uh, future time, or event-based perspective memories, such as having to remember to do something when a certain event occurs. When age-related declines are found, they're more likely to be time-based than event-based. And in laboratory settings, rather than in real-world settings, where older adults can show comparable or slightly better per, uh, perspective. Older adults perform worse on perspective memory tasks than younger adults. External cues help both groups. Okay, so we have a type of memory, perspective memory, which is remember, remembering things we need to do in the future. Uh, humans being uh, the fairly good at it, but like all kind of memory tasks or kind of anything involving cognition, when there are competing tasks, when there are demands on our, when there are multiple demands on our attention, uh, this type of memory uh, decreases. So I'm trying to remember to do something, but you know my child's being annoying or my dog is being annoying, whatever. Uh, I have some bills due. I'm really stressed out about something. Uh, my perspective memory is going to decline. Uh, as stated, there are kind of two uh, perspective memories kind of divided into kind of a two subcomponents. We have the time-based perspective memory, so that's remembering to do something in the future, and an event-based perspective, uh, which is remembering to do something when a certain event occurs. So kind of uh, the presence of a cue. So if I so a buzzer goes off, I need to remember to take my medication. Versus I need to kind of like free recall that one week from now I need to call the doctor's office for whatever reason. Now, interestingly, uh, um, um, older adults perform worse on those time-based uh, uh, tasks uh, than they, they perform worse on time-based tasks than event-based uh, kind of tasks. So, kind of again, uh, time-based tasks, trying to remember, oh, I have to do something into the future, kind of more of a free recall versus event-based uh, tasks, wherein I can have maybe a cue or some kind of signal that reminds me, oh, wait, I'm supposed to do. X, Y, Z, whatever. And they also perform better in real world settings than uh, kind of laboratory settings. 
And this could be uh, due to uh, older adults just not really caring about a, a, a study uh, or a task within a lab environment. So they're like, oh, no, I don't care about this task. It's not that real to me, whatever, who cares? And while in the real world, I'm gonna pay attention, I'm gonna kind of allocate all my resources to make sure that I take this medication on time because it's life and death. Um, it can also be related to a number of external cues that an older adult places in their home. So maybe post-it note reminder, some kind of buzzer reminder, something along those lines. So kind of the pre you can uh, kind of uh, this demonstrates that kind of the um, social reminders and kind of your social environment impacting your ability to perform uh, well on uh, specific types of memory tasks. In this case, perspective memory tasks. There are also age advantages. Fewer age differences are observed when memory cues are available, such as for recognition memory tasks or when individuals can draw upon acquired knowledge or experience. Older adults often perform as well, if not better, than younger adults on tests of world knowledge or word knowledge, I should say, and vocabulary. Experts perform well. Uh, older typists were found to compensate for age-related declines in speed by looking further ahead at printed tests. Compared to younger players, older chess uh, experts focus on a smaller uh, set of possible moves, leading to greater cognitive efficiency. Accrued knowledge of everyday tasks, such as grocery prices, can help older adults to make better uh, decisions than younger adults. So we have a few uh, kind of few key points here. Uh, one being that when there are cues present, as stated, uh, older adults uh, perform can perform well on uh, memory tasks, uh, which kind of again kind of demonstrates that uh, the home environment, uh, kind of your social environment, and even kind of like I said before, kind of those distractors, those stressors in your life contributing to uh, uh, memory performance. Uh, and also, uh, older adults perform better on some tasks, such as uh, vocabulary tasks. And experts who are, you know, kind of going to be older because it takes a long time to become an expert in something, uh, they compensate. And we talked about this throughout this course, and we'll continue to talk about it, is that this compensation mechanism. We see this at a neurological level, but we see this at a behavioral level as well. So older typists who are experts kind of look ahead uh, in, uh, in the text of what they have to type to uh, kind of increase their efficiency. So kind of they are recognizing their, their decline in speed. Uh, and they try to compensate for that by kind of looking further ahead in the text so they know what words are coming next and they can kind of, you know, prepare their fingers and their brain or whatever for the words to type. Interestingly, older chess uh, players kind of looking specifically at smaller subsets of moves instead of kind of the global chess board, uh, which again, kind of focusing on smaller subset of moves, allocating those resources, so recognizing uh, maybe uh, decreased cognitive resources, and then alloc and then uh, allocating those uh, uh, relatively smaller amounts of cognitive resources to specific uh, parts of the board, uh, thus kind of uh, increasing their efficiency. So it's kind of less uh, information at the process because they're looking only at a small chunk of the board versus kind of the whole you know, theoretical chessboard. And then accrued knowledge that you've gained through time uh, can help older adults make decisions. So you kind of have an idea of how much a, a bread should cost. You've bought bread for 40 years. So you kind of have a general idea of, oh, this is how much bread costs or whatever. So I'm not going to get ripped off. Or I can remember uh, I have to buy bread. on I buy bread every Wednesday. So therefore I have to buy bread kind of thing. So kind of, again, social circumstances and compensation contributing to performance uh, or memory performance. Memory and context, contextual perspective, approach to cognition that considers the context within which thought processes takes place and the adaptive nature of cognition, how cognitive abilities adapt to life changes across a life's time. So these are kind of just different uh, theories of memory and context, uh, uh, wherein the contextual approach uh, considers the context within which thought processes takes place. So kind of the idea here is that it's important that uh, older adults and adults in general, you know, you have a, a fairly routine lives uh, in general. And um, uh, therefore you kind of, you can uh, gather information about your environment, expertise, and thus kind of the idea here is that it's important to measure older adults' memory or just memory in general uh, within a, while considering the context in which uh, memory is being measured. So in a lab setting, measuring memory in a lab setting could theoretically be different than measuring memory in, I don't know, like a, the, a horse racing track or something that older adults attend and thus, and have attended for decades and know, you know, how to gamble and where to sit and all that kind of stuff. And then kind of the adaptive nature of cognition, how kind of abilities, so kind of the idea here, adapt to life changes across the time. So kind of the idea here is that, um, 
uh, taking into account how adaptation occurs. So kind of going back to the expert example where older adults kind of consciously and or um, unconsciously recognizing their limitations and then uh, uh, um, shifting their, their strategy. So in the case of the typist looking ahead in the test, te uh, text, that they have to type, and then the chess players are looking at only specific parts of the chessboard uh, as opposed to the entire chessboard. Next, I want to talk about a, a kind of a social challenge to memory, and that's st stereotype threat. And looking at two kind of broad groups, we have kind of a more of an older adult kind of uh, broad uh, group, and then uh, specifically black Americans. So stereotype threat occurs when a person is reminded of or thinking about the negative stereotypes about his or her group, even if uh, this uh, he or she does not believe those stereotypes are true. One consistent finding is that Black Americans underperform uh, compared to white Americans in college, so kind of emerging adults, even after controlling for their levels of preparation. Many negative stereotypes exist about Black Americans' academic performance, so a Black American student will be reminded of those stereotypes in, in, in academic settings. Such anxiety leads to stress and, and subsequently hinders performance. Now let's look at a kind of a classic example here. A uh, stereotype threat was demonstrated in a study involving black Americans and white Americans taking a test of verbal items uh, from the GRE. GRE is kind of a test you take to enter many graduate school programs. Uh, it's a standardized test for any, okay, should have, <laughs> hey, maybe uh, look ahead like the expert typist. Uh, yeah, so anyway, standardized test for entering uh, graduate levels uh, programs. It's like a SAT, but for uh, graduate school. One group uh, took the test after first indicating their race. The second group, there was no race question. Participants just took the test. Black students uh, answered fewer items correctly after indicating their race. White students were unaffected by indicating their race. Uh, this kind of suggests that um, you know, these obviously there are negative stereotypes that, that um, kind of exist within the United States, and, and um, uh, even if you don't believe in those, you can still be negatively impacted by them. And this kind of uh, study suggesting that even kind of the presence of uh, certain questions can kind of act as a cue for uh, the kind of the emergence of those uh, stereotypes within a uh, person's mind and thus kind of negatively impact um, their performance, in this case, on uh, verbal items on the GRE test. So kind of a cognitive, assess a cognitive assessment of, of uh, verbal knowledge. Soto primes can elicit stereotype threats with dramatic consequences. People deal with negative stereotypes by, dis by two ways, uh, disidentifying with this stereotype domain, e.g. I don't care about school, or voting reminders of the stereotype, I'm going to drop out of school. Stereotype threat affects uh, groups other than Black Americans in areas other than acad uh, academic performance. The same effect has been found concerning women in math and older adults in memory performance. Older adults perform better in memory tasks when the quote memory part of the study is de-emphasized. Some of these effects have recently been questioned in terms of replicability and or the size of, of, of effects. So kind of the idea here is that you have two different ways of dealing with negative stereotypes. You can disidentify with them. So saying, you know, I don't care about school at all. I don't, I don't, um, uh, I don't identify as a student. So whatever, these stereotypes don't even matter uh, to me. School sucks anyway, who cares? And then you could just avoid uh, reminders of the stereotype altogether. So just drop out of school. So theoretically you would not be exposed to uh, performing poorly on the GRE kind of stereotype. And as stated, kind of this, uh, these findings have been uh, measured in other groups and have found similar results such as uh, uh, stereotypes of uh, women performing worse on STEM tests, um, uh, impacting uh, their performance on STEM tasks, and older adults when uh, if a um, experimenter kind of primes the older adult by saying, okay, this is a study of memory. And we all know that older adults' memory can be a little, you know, a little rocky. And then uh, kind of that priming can kind of put that in an older adult's head, even if that older adult's like, no, my memory is like, great, screw this guy. Um, but it's still kind of you know, um, uh, as a <laughs> over super overplayed phrase now. It's not even give me cool slang anymore. Way overplayed, two years old. Uh, renting space in their head. Uh, so kind of like uh, distracting uh, and kind of um, uh, just allocating uh, uh, resources towards that stereotype in your mind, kind of decreasing performance. And here's a visualization of a study stereotype threat of older adults. A working memory scores for older adults decreased sharply when they're reminded of the negative age stereotype. When this reminder was reduced, their scores were more similar to their younger gr uh, group. So kind of the idea here, again, kind of a working memory task, and then um, experiments are kind of priming uh, the older adult with um, 
uh, ageist stereotypes and then uh, consequently or there's a correlation between that and um, older adults performing worse on the task. And when that reminder of uh, kind of ageist stereotypes are decreased, uh, the scores between younger adults and older adults on this working memory task um, converge, get closer together. And you can see that in this chart here. And as I alluded to ageism, so let's go ahead and define that. Uh, prejudice based on age. Uh, when older, older individuals believe their culture's negative stereotypes about those who are old, their memory cognitive skills decline. Older individuals in cultures such as China that held more positive views on aging did not show comparative levels of cognitive deficits. When one agrees with the stereotype, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Beliefs in one abilities results in actions that, that make it come true. So kind of uh, stated, uh, kind of ageism impacting a performance on memory task. But interestingly, uh, kind of these uh, views of ageism uh, are different. Uh, across cultures uh, with uh, Chinese uh, older adults um, in general being exposed to more positive attitudes about aging and thus are um, uh, comparatively uneffective or far less effective than Americans uh, when they're primed about uh, kind of aging stereotypes or at least the aging stereotypes uh, that exist within the United States. Moving on to intelligence and obviously beginning of what is intelligence, a beginning with, I should say, what is intelligence? Psychologists can't agree on a precise definition of intelligence. Psychologist Ed Edwin Boring, still a great name, is, quote, intelligence is whatever intelligence tests measure. Uh, defined by the book, it is a visual indicator of the efficiency of various cognitive kind of processes that work together behind the scenes to process information. Now, what's kind of crazy about this chapter is throwing intelligence in here, which can be a whole chapter and an hour and a half discussion itself. But let's try and get through kind of the main points here in a reasonable amount of time. We have the psychometric approach of intelligence, which spawned the development of standardized tests of intelligence. Intelligence, a trait or a set of traits that characterize some people to a greater sense than others. Goal to identify these traits precisely and measure them. So kind of the idea here is that different approaches of intelligence uh, will define intelligence in different ways. And the psychometric approach, which we're kind of most familiar with, especially in the United States, is a kind of standardized test of intelligence that uh, test things like numeral uh, reasoning, verbal reasoning, numerical, inductive reasoning, logical reasoning, etc. Now, interestingly, people in many cultures are becoming more quote unquote intelligent. The current generation has higher IQ scores than earlier generations across uh, cultures. This is defined as the Flynn effect. How much has IQ increased? Increase of five to 25 points per generation. Controversy surrounding what IQ test really measures so kind of the idea here is that, again, a generation is not, uh, um, that kind of shift, uh, you know, what are five to 25 points, you know, we'll just say 15 point a change is not possible for it to be kind of a genetic, a single genetic thing. That's not how genetics work. It's not like a 20 year thing. And then, you know, whoa, we have whole unlock these new cognitive abilities um, in general. Um, Thus suggesting that either there are some kind of environmental factors that are contributing to uh, people being quote unquote more intelligent, aka performing uh, better on quote unquote intelligence tests. And this is referred to as the Flynn effect. It is difficult to understand what increasing IQ scores really mean since what is considered quote intelligent depends on the cultural context. Research shows that different IQ tests show different uh, rates of increases. There are moderate gains are seen across a variety of different measures of intelligence, but the highest increase has been shown by the Raven matrices as a measure of IQ, developed as a, quote, culture-free measure of IQ since it doesn't require specific cultural knowledge or language skills. It relies on basic problem-solving skills. Yet some research suggests that the fact that, that uh, this measure of IQ shows the highest increase over time indicates that the measure is not culture-free. So kind of the idea here, and this is an important uh, part of intelligence and something that, again, can be a very long discussion in itself. Uh, you have to keep in mind that, um, uh, and it's recognized by psychologists now, that uh, quote unquote intelligence depends on the, the cultural context. So what skills, what abilities are necessary to uh, optimally develop and perform well and meet your goals um, individually and collectively uh, depend uh, on that context and that can be considered kind of intelligence. So it's important to keep in mind the environmental uh, factors that uh, contribute to um, or that shape um, what uh, components of quote unquote intelligence uh, is most valued. 
Um, and interestingly, this matrix free test, uh, the, uh, matri uh, the Raven matrices test, which is quote unquote again a culture free test, um, uh, has shown the higher, highest rates of increases, which kind of suggests that maybe it's not a culture free test, but kind of the idea here is that all these, there's multiple IQ tests, there's multiple intelligence tests, uh, and kind of the Flynn effect is demonstrated at different levels. So kind of the, inc the, the rates of increased test performance varies by task, you know, across generations, but in general kind of increased abilities or increased performance on these intelligence tasks with kind of increase, you know, quote unquote, kind of uh, globalization, kind of more exposure to Western uh, education or more formal education in general, maybe kind of uh, or that may kind of reflect those that Flynn effect. So kind of longer rates of schooling, uh, thus kind of exposed to specific types of, of verbal reasoning, logical reasoning. Those, those types of reasoning are taught in uh, specific uh, school programs and thus kind of exposure to kind of those, those, those types of reasoning, uh, contributing to uh, better performance on these tasks. Which again kind of reflects culture, <laughs> culture uh, exposure to these, these uh, cultural values. In that case, uh, deductive reasoning, for example, um, uh, kind of influencing performance on um, uh, intelligence tests and kind of uh, uh, illuminates the uh, role of culture on quote unquote intelligence. So kind of I've uh, went through a few reasons, but let's break them down in more detail. One proposed reason is improved nutrition. Argument is not strongly supported since increased nutrition does not closely parallel uh, high IQ scores. Increased complexity in the world need a higher education now than ever before to get a good job. In 1980, 27% of men in the United States had more than an eighth grade education compared to 96% of men and women in 2017. Increased complexity in pop culture. Plots in movies, shows, and video games. 1950s show Dragnet, whereas the show Game of Thrones had 250 cast members and thereby had multiple storylines. So kind of the idea here is that um, uh, because of an increasing complex world, so kind of getting back to these macro, these chronos uh, levels of development, Bronfenbrenner, um, the, specifically kind of industrialization, uh, more co just more complexity in the world. You need to work machinery, not just kind of work uh, a local kind of a land, uh, agriculture land, but maybe even high, uh, large land, uh, integration, uh, integrative farming, greater technology, just kind of more complex world in general, requiring more education. Public education really did not get off the ground in the U.S. until the late 19th century. And um, you can see this here at the rates of men um, graduating with an eighth grade uh, education only being 27% of men, let alone uh, uh, rates of education for women who were uh, you know, much more uh, disenfranchised from education. Um, but kind of uh, policy changes in education, kind of, okay, uh, the uh, government's reflecting, oh, wait, we're going through industrialization. We need our uh, citizens to know X, Y, Z. They need to have X, Y, Z abilities and know X, Y, Z uh, skills, abilities, and kind of general knowledge. Uh, thus, we need more education. Thus, they're going to be exposed to different forms of reasoning as is measured by psychometric tests. And you can also, as stated, kind of see this reflected possibly in pop culture with a show, a very popular show called Dragnet, having only, uh, you know, one main character or a couple main character versus more modern shows with hundreds of main characters. So kind of a complex new world uh, contributing to uh, um, kind of more exposure to and more practice with uh, practicing skills that are measured in intelligence tests. And that occurring kind of in a global, not just a United States, not just in the U.S., but across the globe. Genes in the environment and intelligence. Some believe IQ test scores or differences are due to genes. Genetic influence does not mean intelligence is unresponsive to environment or set in stone. The environment turns uh, on genes. Epigenetics impacts IQ test scores. The declining influence of the environment on IQ scores is not universally seen across cultures. Mother's IQ is reliably associated with her children's IQ. However, it's difficult to disentangle prenatal expressions or intergenerational genetic expression. So we've talked about this in uh, previous chapters, but kind of the idea here is that just because something may be influenced by ge uh, genetics does not mean that uh, it's set in stone or unresponsive to the environment, as the case of kind of epigenetics 
wherein environmental factors activate, um, you know, kind of like a light switch. Uh, it's kind of conceptually one way of thinking about it. Uh, turning on uh, particular genes, which may be associated with particular uh, behavioral outcomes or developmental outcomes. And uh, mother uh, IQ being uh, correlated with uh, child IQ, it's difficult to kind of disentangle a prenatal environment, which um, uh, it's, uh, some psychologists argue is kind of the most important uh, aspect of development, but it's generally kind of associated with a number of developmental outcomes. So kind of the environment still may be uh, impacting uh, child's development, but in utero, and also intergenerational genetic expression. So kind of epigenetics across generations, maybe kind of contributing to uh, uh, differences in performance on intelligence tests. But this kind of conceptual, not really measured and it's kind of uh but kind of the point is it's kind of it's difficult to disentangle kind of these potential uh, environmental influences uh and kind of the and uh the impact of of genetics on intelligence uh a performance on intelligence tasks now interestingly uh, gene, uh adverse child events and uh, environmental stressors predict iq test scores cumulative effect that is the more you add the faster iq drops so studies have kind of uh, measured the impact of the totality of cumulative stress uh, on the individual's uh, IQ uh, test score, uh, wherein the uh, more uh, stress, stress factors, kind of more adversity exposed to an individual, the lower their uh, IQ uh, test uh, scores are uh, as adults and emerging adults. So kind of those uh, childhood stressors, uh, kind of cumulatively combining to kind of decrease uh, IQ test scores um, um, in adulthood. And obviously those cumulative stressors, exposure to cumulative stress is associated with class. And you can kind of see this uh, in the chart, uh, wherein uh, you can measure IQ test scores at like, t you know, uh, very early on, you know, um, or something similar to IQ test scores, some kind of measure of cognitive ability at you know two, three years old, and then kind of track them across their, and then track those same children across uh, uh, their lifespan. And in the individuals who had similar cognitive abilities at two, three, four years old, um, you can see uh, the kind of the paths uh, separate, wherein uh, individuals in higher classes performing better on. Um, uh, these uh, intelligence tests than uh, individuals and uh, poorer individuals, even though they start in the exact same uh, initial IQ score. Uh, kind of, again, suggesting that this kind of cumulative process uh, kind of exerts a biological, psychological, and social role and kind of puts you in social circumstances wherein you're less exposed to uh, resources, educational resources that would you know, uh, help you perform better on those intelligence tasks. And this gets to the cumulative deficit hypothesis. The negative effects of, 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 uh, of cumulative stress accumulated over time. Early childhood stunting and the number of people living in absolute poverty um, are some indicators of poor development. Uh, both indicators are closely associated with poor cognitive and educational performance. Conservatively, over 200 million children under the age of five are not fulfilling their developmental potential. And you can see in kind of the right-hand corner, kind of this uh, idea wherein uh, individuals uh, are exposed to different quality environments and in a rich environments, an individual uh, will develop optimally. So you can, it's kind of uh, more correct to conceptualize kind of performance on these IQ test scores or any kind of uh, IQ, um, educational performance or kind of intelligence test as it kind of existing on a range. Uh, everybody kind of has a variability of possible scores where and uh, if individuals are exposed to enriching environments, um, uh, um, they are more likely to develop on kind of the far right end of their range that is uh, develop uh, most optimally, meet their full uh, developmental potential. And as stated, this cumulative deficit uh, accumulates throughout the lifespan, and then this is reflected in uh, adult um, developmental outcomes, in this case, kind of performance on education slash intelligence tests. Now, the previous theory is kind of related to, and you can kind of si find similarities um, with the social sociobiographical history theory. This uh, is a theory that states that the level of professional prestige, social position, and income that one experienced throughout one's life impacts other cognitive abilities and their rates of decline. 
It argued the rate of cognitive decline is the same regardless of background privileges earned or received, but had privileged, but more privileged individuals had higher base levels of measured cognitive abilities. So basically, what they're arguing here is that um, uh, there are similar rates for decline of memory, or cognitive ability, of performing well on intelligence tests uh, for all individuals. However, um, uh, uh, older, uh, older adults who have more professional prestige, they have a higher social position, they have more income, they have more kind of uh, diversity of experience, enriching experience, cognitively and psychologically and socially enriching experience, has kind of a higher baseline amount of cognitive ability because they've uh, live kind of that enriched uh, environment uh, wherein they're exposed to all these uh, resources that helped uh, kind of develop uh, meets uh, help to uh, meets uh, or I should say contribute to their uh, optimal development in their cognitive abilities. So thus, because they have that kind of higher reservoir, that higher like baseline level of cognitive ability due to kind of like uh, the state of social prestige, all these environmental factors, the rate of decline is going to, uh, they're going to perform better on tasks because even though the rate of decline is the same, the, the individuals of higher class, of more social prestige, are, st are starting from a higher baseline amount of kind of theoretical cognitive ability. So the rates are the same, but the baseline abilities are different and that impacts uh, differences and that and it has demonstrated theoretically um, through these uh, differences in, in uh, intelligence test performance across uh, classes. However, other um, research has found that people with less formal schooling show more cognitive decline as the years pass. So that is the rate of the uh, cognitive decline are increased uh, for individuals with less formal schooling. Uh, predicts rate of cognitive decline, fewer years of formal schooling associated with higher cognitive decline compared to same age peers, maybe actually measuring formal schooling. Intellectual activity, isolated and inactive adults show the most decline in IQ. Cognitive processes are preserved for people who exercise uh, processes uh, regularly through activities like chess or crossword uh, puzzles. So kind of unlike the social his, um, historical view, which is kind of like the rates of decline are the same, but the baseline uh, ability is different. This is basically arguing that rates of decline are different depending on uh, formal schooling. And those with less formal schooling uh, demonstrate uh, uh, lower levels of of, or I should say higher levels of decline. So less schooling, higher rates of decline, negative correlation. Um, thus kind of it may be measuring, uh, these kind of tests may be measuring formal schooling. And this might be kind of correlated with the idea that more intellectual activity. So more schooling, an individual's more uh, interested in, possibly more interested in um, more educational enriching experience. And that can just be because, you know, they were never exposed to it. Uh, it's not relevant to their world. They, they were not educated through a formal system. Uh, and that kind of inactivity that um, through kind of uh, kind of exercises kind of contributing to a uh, quicker rate of decline. And uh, studies kind of uh, support this because um, uh, individuals who kind of exercise these kind of the processes through kind of chess and crossword puzzles show um, uh, lower rates of uh, cognitive decline. Socialization through education. So this kind of gets back to what I was saying before about uh, understanding context. Uh, it's important to keep context in mind and uh, culture in mind uh, when discussing intelligence. So Loria, who's kind of like a classic uh, cross-cultural psychologist slash kind of anthropologist, uh, posed the same question to people without formal education. And the, and the question was, in a group of four objects, a hammer, a saw, wooden logs, and an ax, what object does not belong? How did you limit your choice? Uh, eliminate your choice, how did you draw your conclusion? So you're presented with four objects and you ask and you ask an individual, which of these objects do not belong? And in, in general, individuals kind of of the West will say a wooden log because the other uh, three objects are uh, tools. Now, interesting, as what I was alluding to, uh, Loria posed the same question to people without formal education. Uh, the grouping could be done by either relationship or shared attributes. For people with formal education, this task is more straightforward. Solving the problem by saying the log doesn't belong requires people to form an abstract category for common attributes in this, in this set of objects. People without formal schooling in this study did not necessarily re rely on the use of abstract categories over personal experience or familiarity. 
Evidence across a variety of cultures shows that formal education encourages people to think abstractly and go beyond knowledge derived from direct experience, affects people's ability to create taxonomic categories that are categories based on some shared uh, attribute or role, and the ability to uh, uh, think abstractly uh, predicts higher IQ on intelligence tests. Studies on formal education underscore how the concept of intelligence is intertwined with cognitive skills acquired through cultural learning. So kind of the idea here is that, again, kind of presented with those four uh, objects, a saw, a hammer, a wooden log, and an ax, and I ask you to, what's the correct answer? And then a Western individual in general will say, as I stated, the law doesn't belong because it's, um, it doesn't, it's not a tool. It doesn't belong to this abstract category that I've created in my, in my mind. However, Loria found that individuals who were exposed to less formal education or, or not formal education, they will, they will say something like, it is not impossible. It's not possible for me to know because I don't, under, I don't know uh, who this theoretical person is what that theoretical, theoretical person's needs are. Do they need the tool? Do they need the log? Does the log go with the axe? I have no idea. It's impossible to know. So kind of that ability through to think in a certain way is developed through formal education. And you know, so it's kind of a more of a difference than kind of a uh, evidence of kind of a of, of inferiority, uh, a different way of thinking. And that's kind of what uh, IQ and intelligence uh, tests measures kind of that abstract uh, taxonomic way of sorting uh, information. And thus again, kind of demonstrating the impact of culture in formal education on uh, IQ scores, because those abstract uh, thinking strategies are correlated uh, with uh, higher IQ. And finally, race and uh, ethnicity and IQ. Most studies find racial and ethnic differences in IQ scores, that is group averages. Most research does not find evidence for genetic differences between races. Study conducted in Germany after World War II compared the IQ test scores of children of black American soldiers and white German mothers with the children of white American soldiers and white German mothers. In both groups, mothers raised the children. However, there are no differences in IQ test scores. Other studies have examined whether black Americans with white uh, European ancestries obtain a quote boost in IQ relative to those with fewer white in European ancestors, which would be expected if racial differences were genetic. However, there are no differences in IQ test scores. So kind of the idea here is uh, kind of testing this ability of, you know, this abstract notion of race uh, in IQ test scores and the research and these studies demonstrate that there is uh, no correlation uh, between kind of this, I, this uh, hypothetical racial difference in IQ, innate racial uh, differences in um, IQ test scores. So as stated in these two studies, you have kind of two groups of individuals in Germany after World War One or World War II, I should say, uh, with um, uh, uh, children of uh, black American soldiers and uh, uh, white German mothers and children of uh, white uh, American soldiers and white German mothers, both raised by the mothers. And then you can kind of compare IQ test scores. And that study found uh, no differences in between IQ test scores. Uh, kind of the same thing, uh, kind of uh, measuring or uh, some uh, um, idea of a white uh, boost in IQ due to white ancestry and uh, black Americans and, and then comparing to other individuals with less uh, uh, white ancestry and comparing their IQ test scores and again no differences. So again kind of again, uh, demonstrating the, that uh, no differences, there's no innate differences between race and ethnicity instead kind of reflecting all these other environmental factors we discussed, uh, stereotypes, threats, uh, class, um, exposure to formal education, cumulative stress, adverse environments, etc. All contributing to differences of group averages uh, not, you know, uh, much variability. There's more variability within groups in general. It's kind of a general finding in statistics that there's more variability within groups than across groups. That is, there's more differences within groups than across groups uh, compared to other groups. All right, let's talk about uh, some theories and uh, changing uh, of, of change in cognition across older adulthood and then uh, some predictors of decline and then we'll wrap it up. So attention and problem solving. The processing speed theory suggests that as the nervous system slows with advanced age, our ability to process information declines. The slowing of processing speed may explain age differences on many different cognitive tasks. Older adults also need longer time to complete mental tasks or make decisions. 
When given sufficient time, older adults perform as competently as do young, as uh, compared to younger adults. When speed is not imperative to the task, healthy uh, older adults do not show cognitive declines. So kind of the idea here is that uh, just in general, kind of a slowing of the nervous system, um, which kind of contributes to kind of a, slow, a slower ability to process information with age. And uh, kind of the support for this theory is uh, in studies that um, you administer like a cognitive task and then you time it and you say, okay, you have X amount of seconds, go. Um, older adults perform worse than younger adults on those types of tasks. However, if you um, um, increase that time or just remove the time limit, older adults will perform at um, comparable levels or kind of equal levels uh, to younger adults on certain um, uh, mem uh, mental tasks. Another theory and possible differences for why older adults perform worse on, uh, on uh, memory tasks, cognitive tasks, is the inhibition theory. It argues that older adults have difficulty with inhib inhib inhibitory uh, functioning or the ability to focus on certain information while suppressing attention to less pertinent information tasks. Evidence comes from directed forgetting uh, research. In directed forgetting, people are asked to forget or ignore some information but not other information. Uh, participants are asked to memorize a list of words, but are then told that the researcher made a mistake and gave you the wrong list and asked you to forget the list. You are then given a second list to memorize. While most uh, people do well at forgetting the first list, older adults are more likely to recall more words from the forget to recall list than our younger adults. So kind of the idea here being that inhibition uh, cognitive ability kind of declines with age, thus you can uh, less ability to supp suppress distracting or irrelevant information. And the and one example or one way to measure this is in the forget this list task, wherein I imagine two groups of individual or two groups, one being uh, younger adults, older adults. I give each group a set of words to memorize, and I say, oh shit, my bad, I gave you the wrong list. Actually, delete that from your memory and memorize this new list of words. And, what, and the studies have found that older adults are more likely to recall the words from the incorrect forget to recall list than our younger adults, which again kind of suggests that they're in a, uh, a relatively uh, lower ability to inhibit that kind of distracting irrelevant information. But the question is, are cognitive losses exaggerated? While there are information processing losses in a late adulthood, overall loss has been exaggerated. One explanation is that the type of tasks that people are tested on tend to be meaningless. Older adults are not motivated and remember to uh, remember a random list of words in a study, but they are motivated for more meaningful material related to their life and consequently perform better on those tests. Research is often cross-sectional. When age comparisons occur longitudinally, however, the amount of loss diminishes. So kind of the idea here is that losses are uh, have been uh, over-exaggerated. Um, this can be uh, due to uh, the tasks that are that older adults are asked to perform. Uh, maybe uh, are irrelevant to their lives. They don't really care. They're like, I'm not, I don't care. Who, and, but um, if a task is relevant to their life, they'll try more and because it's more meaningful. Um, and uh, sometimes life and death, such as taking your medication, they'll try more and perform better on those tasks. And, and some studies support that notion that the more... Um, uh, kind of emotionally salient, the more relevant to the life a task is, the better older adults perform. Also, research is often cross-sectional. So kind of then that can be uh, uh, tr troublesome because you can be conflating uh, various generational effects, cohort effects um, that are not uh, picked up in cross-sectional research. So uh, comparing older adults, uh, you know, 20, uh, you know, 10 years ago to younger adults, those older adults had way less education as we already covered and thus kind of exposed to less f uh, formal education, less abstract thinking, um, and possible kind of less uh, cognitively stimulating activities to kind of like keep, you know, their cognitive processes sharp. Thus, uh, may, they may have have higher rates of decline than another a, a future cohort of older adults who have more formal education, exercise more, eat more healthy, uh, cognitively exercise more as well. So thus, kind of looking at those results that may only exist within that particular time and then kind of describing that as a universal phenomenon, um, that could be one reason why uh, cognitive losses are exaggerated. 
The loss may be due to a lack of opportunity in using various skills. When older adults practice skills, they performed as well as they had previously. Although diminished performance speed is effectively noteworthy in the elderly, removing the effect of speed diminishes the individual's performance decline significantly. Longitudinal research has proposed that deficits in sensory functioning explain age differences in a variety of cognitive abilities. More years of education and subsequently higher income are associated with higher cognitive levels and slower cognitive declines. So kind of a state aid class, uh, which is also correlated to race and kind of disability status, all these other things, um, uh, contributing to kind of rates of decline in a kind of initial uh, cognitive level, and then kind of opportunities to practice skills. So with, as stated, older adults not maybe being less exposed to uh, formal education and kind of the continuing education and contributing to a decrease in ability because they just have kind of less practice attempts at those particular skills that are measured by uh, intelligence tests. And finally, predictors of the decline. People who have cardiovascular disease or other chronic illnesses show steeper declines in mental abilities than their healthier peers, unstimulating lifestyle, such as low social status, engaged in fewer activities and dissatisfied with their lives. Adults who exercise uh, their crystallized abilities continue to display improvements on specific cognitive tasks into their 70s, doing crossword puzzles, identifying uh, uh, synonyms and other verbal tasks represent components of intelligence dependent on accrued knowledge over speed of processing. When the client occurs, it is less extreme than once thought. Precautions to take to retain a higher cognitive functioning throughout life, average decline becomes more substantial in the, in, uh, as an individual reaches their uh, 80s. So kind of the idea here is that chronic illnesses are associated with uh, greater declines and uh, mental uh, kind of cognitive abilities uh, throughout the lifespan, which could really kind of respect that that could reflect that chronic abilities may be uh, driving some of the differences between older adults and younger adults' performance on intelligence tests or any cognitive test, but also unstimulating lifestyles uh, such as again lower class, engage in fewer activities, dissatisfaction with their life kind of social isolation, all these kind of contributing to uh, steeper declines of cognitive abilities. And adults who exercise both physically and mentally um, show, can show improvements actually on specific cognitive tasks into their 70s. And when declines do occur, they are less extreme than uh, previously thought. And the, uh, but the, and the rates of the decline are not consistently steep, with the average decline becoming more substantial as an individual is in their 80s. All right, everyone, thank you so much uh, for listening, and I'll see you next week.